Welcome back, 1570 AM WNST. My next guest is Nestor J. Aparicio. Nestor, welcome in. It is good to be here, or as Keith Richards says, it's good to be anywhere. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, th this is the slow time for sports, right? Like, this is the time where you're trying to figure out what you're going to watch. But I'm really into the NFL offseason, and I don't know exactly why maybe it's because everything else is cleared out i'm not an olympic guy i mean i'm obviously following uh you know what's going on in the ukraine and, and russia and i'm you know send my heart out to everybody who's of ukrainian descent and has people there um i'm following that a little bit more than i'm following anything else but i i find the nfl off season and what's going to happen and maybe it's because i booked the flight for the owners meetings in a couple of weeks maybe it's because free agencies a minute away and the Ravens lost six games in a row. I think the Ravens off season is really, really interesting. And uh, I'm going to be talking more sports and more about that than maybe I even had planned because when you lose six games in a row and there's this much sort of tumult and the change of, of leadership, uh, I'm I'm very fascinated by this Ravens offseason. I think this is going to be a springboard for the next five years for them. And I sense the importance of it. And I, I sense Steve Bishotti's, um, issues with this with the leadership change and with the injuries and with the losing streak so I, i'm finding the ravens offseason to be more fascinating than anything else sports yes yeah, certainly there's a lot to un unpack with the nfl mestre and many many layers to the ravens they just uh, made a move with the strength and conditioning department which we knew we thought would be coming right with all the injuries that they suffered preseason and during the season so there have to be wholesale changes in many many different areas uh plus player movement, which already, you know, the agents have had conversations with potential suitors, but we get Tennessee strength and conditioning coach, and they've been a very hard nosed team for forever. So I'm looking forward to see just what that uh, one change does for their off season program. Does it make the players stronger? Does it make them better? Uh, they call it the wellness sorry, of the players, which I think it's a huge factor, right? To me, the best avail ability is availability in any discipline. So if the players can be available, it gives a team a much better chance to be successful than losing the last six games as they did last year. Well, and this is the uh, time Brian Billick would always say time for pay and a time for play. This is the time for pay. So whatever Antonio Brown is up to and whatever the Ravens are doing with Lamar Jackson in regard to, and, and the ball's in Lamar's court in that case, right? I mean, this is going to be about Lamar taking $37 million a year and a $75 million bonus and understanding it or having an agent that says, this is a good deal or this is not a good deal. I think that's the biggest concern with Lamar. And make no mistake about it, for Eric and the organization to have him under contract, it allows them to function. It allows them to function outside of him being a $45 million cap number next year as a franchise tag guy, right? So um, it gives them cap certainty, right? I mean, you run a business, we all want some cost certainty, right? I mean, that's what the baseball strikes about is cost certainty, right? In, in, in regard to Lamar, the fact that he is not represented is, it's bizarre. I think it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. And, and I think, um, I, I, there's no predicting the outcome. There's no predicting when he or whomever, you know, whoever he has in his team, reads this esoteric $200 million contract and says, this is good for you or this is bad for you. I, I don't know who that person is for Lamar. And that would be the fascinating part. If I were to sit with Lamar, I'm like, what What are you really thinking? Like, what, what is your strategy on this? Is your strategy to go out and win the Super Bowl and be the highest paid? Blah, 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 or is it to take care of your family? You know, he's making $23 million this year. It's a lot of money, right? Like to, to him, it's more money than he's ever seen in his life. He's already got enough money to buy whatever car, chain, house that he wants because he's made in that way. The question would be, at what point is it fertile for him to say, I'll take the $75 million bonus or the $85 million bonus or the $39 million cap number or the $42 million, whatever it is, I that's the hardest part of this is doing business with someone that doesn't really understand business and has never negotiated a deal in his life and won't know a good deal from a bad deal when it's in front of him. I, I don't know what to say about all that, but that's the situation the Ravens are in. It's bad enough having Aaron Rodgers. It's bad enough having uh, certainly the kid down in, in Houston right now with all these allegations and all those problems. But, or having a quarterback you don't believe in, like Ryan Tannehill or Jimmy Garoppolo. But now you got a kid you believe in, a guy you want to pay, a guy who's been injured, all of that. 
and you can't, you don't have a grown up to come to, to negotiate, to get the deal done so I can go run the rest of my business because it really does affect the rest of the Ravens business, whether he signs or not, they have a plan for it, but it'd be a lot better if, if he signed. Oh. You can bet they have a plan for it. They have a contingency plan, a contingency plan to the contingency plan. This is in sharp contrast, uh, Nestor, to 2012 when Joe Flacco, actually 2011 when Joe Flacco bet on himself and put himself in position for a mega deal. But he also had Joe Linta negotiating for him, and he was able to get the most fertile contract, the richest contract in NFL history at the time. I believe it was six years for $120 million, a lot of it guaranteed. And that's the big difference is it's the unknown at this point, because when we heard Eric DaCosta, this presser a couple of weeks ago, he said he's negotiating with the player himself, not his mother, not his team of influences, but Lamar. And Lamar is comfortable what he is right now. Now, he may be comfortable at 23 million this year. Next year, if they choose to franchise him, I believe the number is going to be 28 million, which they certainly can live with. But. Ideally, they get this thing done sooner than later, but I don't, I don't see any sense of urgency from the player, which is really, really bizarre. Yeah, because the Ravens don't have to do anything here. And the longer it goes out, the better it is for the Ravens to not have made a commitment to a guy who runs in the linebackers, right? But the fact that the Ravens want to make that commitment and he doesn't, that does smack back to Joe. And look, I remember sitting with Joe at his favorite restaurant up in his hometown in Philly. We're sitting there drinking iced teas and we're watching March Madness. His name's all over every place in town. The bakery's got congratulations, Joe, up, uh, you know, up in his little town in, in, in Jersey. And, and in Joe's voice, and, and you can almost hear him say it, well, you know, I figured a bet on myself because, like, you know, if I got hurt, I get hurt, whatever. But, like, if I didn't get hurt and we just made the playoffs, I still was going to get paid. Yep. They, You know, there was still going to be a market for me, and then I could pit one team against another without just taking the deal. So, you know, Joe had it all pegged in his mind and was real comfortable with the fact that my knee might get ripped up. Like, he was really comfortable with that. And I guess he, Lamar is, too. I don't know. I mean, if Lamar gets squirted out of this thing four years from now – and has a bad year next year, if he has a bad year next year, because the team has a bad year. He had a bad year last year. The team had a bad year, right? Everybody got injured, right? So Eric DaCosta, John Harbaugh, they all had a bad year last year, some of it because of him and his injury. But there were a lot of extenuating factors. But if Lamar Jackson finds himself, and and after huddling up with RG3 for two years, that he doesn't get Big Daddy advice to say, take the money take care of your family you're happy here these people love you take the money there will be more money later and if you win the second super bowl you can come back with the gun and say i'm not coming to training camp until you renegotiate you know you can play all of those games when you have that card take the money you're a running quarterback you you gimped around for two months the team lost six games in a row take the money you, you would say that to your son. I oh, would say that to my absolutely. son in a heartbeat. It would be get your best deal right now and and move on and let's take care of your family in case something – in case Russia invades Ukraine and right. it leads to global whatever. Well, get your money. Even with the non-running quarterbacks such as Joe Flacco was and is with a big arm pocket passer, you'd still give them the same advice. Take the money. The The – you're, you're one hit away from your career being over and done with. And it's just maddening that that I, I thought for sure, Ness, that during the bye week this past season, they would come to terms because Lamar was playing lights out, the best he's ever played in his career from the pocket. He was super hot. And I thought with a bye week, that would have been the perfect time for the two sides to come together. And I was pretty much stunned they didn't put it together at that time. Well, there is no putting it together. There's him. I got it. There, there, there is no Eric's on the phone with Joe Linta watching Lamar practice. There, there is waiting for Lamar to come up to the office, hand him a contract, and then he's got to either sign it or not sign it and take it home and put it in his desk or show it to his buddies or, you know, like I, I don't know what to say, but that is the number one issue for the team because they're going to go as the quarterback goes. Right. And um, the fact that he's throwing the football and – um, showing off a little bit. That, that's his personality. That's a part of being 24 years old, I guess, yeah, yeah. that he's showing that he's healthy and overthrows and underthrows and whatever. It doesn't matter in February. But the fact that he's out throwing two teammates is, 
It's who he is. It's why they want to give him the. They love him. Absolutely. He's a hard worker. He's well, a trier. He's an improver. That's part of him running into linebackers when he has no running backs and running okay. the ball 21 times. Is he tries so damn hard? That's why they love him. But being a team first guy that he is, right? Very lovable, very coachable, um, competitive as hell. He wants to win the Super Bowl. He has to understand that if he signs this year, this offseason, gives the team an extra $10 million in cap space, that can get him another player or two or three that can help him achieve his ultimate goal of winning his first Super Bowl. So why wouldn't he do that? See, you sound like the gray-haired guy with the contract trying to get him to sign now. That sounded very... I don't know if I trust you, Dennis, on that. You that should trust me. Explain you should, that you to should me. trust me with your life. Explain, yeah, I, I, you, you understand what I'm saying to you. Explain that to me. You know, it's so the old on. Tom Brady. I'm helping you to help you hey. to help you get more team. Like, I, I can just imagine these guys are all twisted up, right? They've had these agents in their ears all sure. these years. Sure I, they are. I don't know what Lamar's math skills are or what, what if he can read an insurance contract or, you know, I, I get insurance read on up. himself because Look. an agent right now would say, Lamar, let's play this sharp. You're going to win the Super Bowl. You're Rod Tidwell. Right. Um, so you're going to get 45. So let's not take 37. But I tell you what, you're making 22 this year. Let's take 650,000 of that and buy some insurance Absolutely. for 80 million. And that's what that's what these sharp guys do. I don't think he has anybody doing anything. The, oh. the understanding is he doesn't have anybody doing anything like if that. He does, that. He's if, playing video games and shooting okay. Instagram videos. And that the level of sophistication, the level of sophistication he has to have to not have an agent, no offense, but it's not that sophisticated. If if if, if you if I'm going to court today and I say to you, Den, I'm going to court, I'm represent myself today, you're going to be like, this is not as smart as I think he is, right? I mean, you would just say that on the fact, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You never do that. And the other here's the other piece too. You, you know, whatever the, the numbers may be, whether it's six fifty or whatever, you if you want my player to come to camp, you buy the insurance policy for me. You you put the burden on the team. Yeah, he'll come up, he'll he'll show up, but you've got to protect my player or meet me halfway or something. But you have to protect the player. I think the the team protected themselves with the Ronnie Stanley contract. If I read between the tea leaves during uh, the Costas press conference, I'm pretty sure they bought a. Uh, not a warranty, but an insurance policy on in case of uh, an injury with, with Stanley. So again, he, he does count against the cap, but they'll be able to recoup that money should he retire. You have to play defense as an organization, but also as the player and more so the, the player. I wonder in the history of sports, how many insurance companies have stroked that 50 or 60 or $80 million check to a team because I, I, and look, we've all dealt with insurance companies, right? My friends at Blondell Miller Schuller go and fight with them every day, right? So to get their money, uh, because they don't give it up. Uh, they don't just say, oh, you got a claim? No, right. here you go. Do you remember the Albert Bell thing? Like, oh, I, yeah. I, I wrote about that in the Peter Principles. The guy that wrote that, that deal stayed employed by Angelos, Bob Ames, for a decade and a half. Bob Ames saved Peter $65 million dollars. In insurance when sure. Albert Bell, but the thing they had to do with Albert Bell was ship him down the, to, to Florida, have him gimp into the batter's box, have him limp around. Like literally they had to do all of that to show that like my wife to get insurance when she was bald and dying had to like show that she was dying. It was unbelievable. Right, right, right. It was unbelievable what she had to do to keep her salary even though she had insurance because they were trying to screw her. And course, I would think the same thing would be said with Ronnie Stanley or any of these things that if they have insurance, the insurance company doesn't want to pay the, the premium. And if Ronnie Stanley comes back and plays left tackle this year, you know, I don't know how these premiums work, but it, it is career ending. And to, for it to be career ending in the cash of $60 million deal, you have to pretty much do what the Orioles did with Bell, which is sort of flaunt it. You, right, you have right. to go out and run around like a, a distressed duck in order to show that you can't perform anymore. No, I, I get it. I get it. And some of these players are very smart. They plan their careers. Uh, uh, Marlon Humphrey's going through that right now, from what I understand. And Ronnie Stanley's close to him. And, and you know what? They're at some point, once you've gotten paid and you have your health and uh, you reduce your risk of CTE, which we know is, is prevalent in the NFL. Sometimes players make a business decision for themselves. It's not well, the love of the game. The way a lot of guys have walked away, sure. right? Sure. I we mean, saw John out. Urschel. Well, I had John Urschel on my show and, uh, when he was drafting. I said, "Hey, are you a football player? Or are you a scientist?" He's, "Oh no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a football player through and through." And guess what? 
He was a scientist. He, <laughs> at the end of the day, as soon as that report came out with CT, the next day, he, he, what did he do? He retired. He said, I'm not doing this because he was too smart. And sometimes that's, that's the danger when you, when you take a player, and I'm not saying it's in a bad way, they're too smart for their own good. They're not, they're not uh, a Ray Lewis, uh, a Terrell Suggs, who will do anything and take anything and put anything in their body to be successful. Like most special athletes, uh, that's the dark side of them, but that's what makes them great too. They'll do anything to win. And some guys aren't wired that way. Well, Bill Belichick will do anything to win. I'll see him down at the owners meetings in a couple of weeks as well. So, Hey, uh, it is an interesting off season, right? For the NFL, for as much as we love the league and as good Absolutely. as the Super Bowl was, as good as the season was, and for all the problems and all the racism and all the sexism and all the oh, yeah. Daniel Snyder and all the lying and all of the backstabbing with John Gruden and the Raiders and, you know, and Stephen Ross and throwing games and Brian Flores. Um, Matt, we're just starting out. We, we haven't even, this is just a tip of the iceberg here in the office season yeah and we haven't even had quarterbacks move around yet we don't know where Garoppolo is going to play or who's going to take Carson Wentz on or where Ryan Tannehill is going to be or Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson that's all, all those seats are going to get filled in the plane before we even get to uh whatever the Ravens are doing with Calais Campbell or who's going to get caught or Bradley Bozeman where he's going to go get his 12 million dollars a year or, yeah. um all of that's going to happen but it's all going to happen the next three four weeks i mean it's it's fast hey man we're eight weeks out on the draft right we got oh my god that's crazy this week combine tampering free agency draft cycle no opening day right. <laughs> opening who yeah that's <laughs> not many people i've talked are missing it either by the way i, I went out to dinner with some friends the other night and Nobody, nobody cared. Uh, the, the, the town, uh, I think, is very apathetic towards the Major League Baseball and particularly the Baltimore Orioles. And that's a, really, that's a really, that's a bad word. In, they, they were really in deep poop when they couldn't sell out opening day. Yeah. You know, they, they, they started playing these games. Joe Enoch and I would always, it was like a fun little thing we would do. Once tickets came online, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, in that range, you could go online and see they were hoarding the tickets, right? So if you, Dennis, you want to, you want a ticket for you and your family for opening day, you have to buy a 13 game plan. And then nobody would do that. Or a handful of people would do that. And then on, if opening day was April 3rd, April 1st, 21,000 tickets would appear online. They would all be 89, 95 to sit in the bleachers and whatever. And people wouldn't come. And then opening day would happen and there'd be 4,000 empty seats. And I think to myself, they just outthought themselves. You know what I mean? There are 4,000 people that would be here as a part of this, but they let their business department get right. in front of taking their marquee event opening day where they're zero and zero. It's the only day they're going to be zero and zero and, you know, a community event and making it some sort of exclusive thing that you had to spend 150 bucks to be a part of or buy all these other things. And I, They've just done so many things to turn people off, let alone the game itself. And now they have a, wall, a lockout and all that other stuff. Just I don't know what's going to bring people back uh, other than Paul McCartney, which Paul McCartney would bring people back, by the way. Absolutely. Nestor, as always, I appreciate your time, your thoughts, and your insight. Always a pleasure having you on. I'll get back to where I once belong. Yes, you will. I appreciate it. There he goes. <laughs> I'm going to do Beatles drops for you every week now. <laughs> That's good, man. The very musical and entertaining Nestor J.F. Reese here at 1570 a.m. WNST will take a quick break and come back right after this.